Just before we uh, get down to business, you have been uh, praying, some of you, for David Watson, who has been critically ill. He's now home, uh, inoperable, and uh, just been sewn up. And medically, it's only a matter of time. But um, some people are really believing God for healing. And a healing, if you've ever heard of it, Church of England people will... Are there any Anglicans in this student body? Any Church of England? Yes, well, you'll know what I mean when I say that a healing Eucharist service is being held next Tuesday in St. Michael's Belfry, York. I'm going over to that, and uh, several from this district will be. But it's a national thing. He's in... David Watson, of course, is in London. But uh, we want to give, by faith, the Lord an opportunity to work a miracle in answer to prayer. It would be a tremendous testimony if David recovered. On the other hand, God knows best what he's doing. So would you turn now in your Bible, one moment, to John chapter 7. And um, I'll just read... The last portion of it, from verse 40, uh, and I read through verse 12 of, cha of uh, chapter 8. <clears throat> when they heard these words, some of the people said, this is really the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ is descended from David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then went back to the chief priests and Pharisees, who said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered him, answered them, Are you led astray, or you also? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd who do not know the law are accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before, and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he said, what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search, and you will see that no prophet is to rise from Galilee. They went each to his own house. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such. What do you say about her? This they said to test him, that, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the eldest, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus looked up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and do not sit again, sin again. Again Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We'll leave it there at the moment. Just bow our heads to pray and seek God's help as our closing hour of today and sing quietly together. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus. <clears throat> Thank you, God, for sending Jesus. Thank 
Thank you, Jesus, that you came. Holy Spirit, won't you teach me more about his wonderful name? Thank you, Lord, for your presence through this day with us all and for all that we've been taught and learned from your word and by your grace have received and by faith are seeking to make it ours. Now, in the closing hour, when we're all tired and mentally at stretch, we ask you, Holy Spirit, to come afresh and give us liberty to think, to speak, to understand your word, make the book live to each one of us, show us ourselves and show us our Savior, and make the book live to each of us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Just one word about uh, how we're getting on. In the um, analysis of the Gospel that you have, part A, you'll see that this concludes at the end of chapter 12. At the end of chapter 12. That it is marked on the uh, analysis as the close of our Lord's public ministry. I'm afraid, though perhaps you might be glad, um, that I won't be able to get further than that this term. Because having lost uh, 12 hours teaching last term, and of course not expecting to be able to uh, make those hours up this term, because others are already booked for lectures, uh, that's as far as we can get. So the test will be set on that first part only. And the lectures will conclude with uh, chapter 12, verse uh, chapter 12 at the end of that chapter. Okay? I hope that uh, is comparatively good, good news. Though I find it just a little bit frustrating. It's nobody's fault but my own. Now, already, <coughs> I, uh, I don't mean cough. I mean, just get ready. <coughs> now, just to conclude chapter 7 by noting that tremendous verse again, that promise of Jesus and the explanation of it that John gave in verse 39. Anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, which those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so, sixty years after this utterance of our Lord, John explains it in the light of experience, verse, in verse 39, that the Lord Jesus was referring to the gift of the Spirit. John explains that here. Not until Jesus was glorified could the Spirit be given. I'll repeat that. Not until Jesus was glorified could the Spirit be given. I mean glorified historically. And not until he is glorified spiritually in your life and mine do we possess him. It's when we come and drink that he begins to flow. Got that? No. Just a bit. Sixty years. That's about um, 1890 when John, this gospel was written. Sixty years after this utterance of Jesus, John explains it in the light of his experience. Verse 39, that the promise of our Lord related to the Holy Spirit. Jesus had to be glorified historically before the Spirit could be given. I can't get diverted onto a message on the Holy Spirit, but you all know why that was so, I hope. Here is God's perfect man who has been absolutely obedient to his Father, and has fulfilled the obligation of the law 
and has died in our place and risen from the dead and received of his Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. You would see that if we uh, related more fully in John 14, 15 and 16, the greatest chapters in the Bible on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. John 14 through 16. Jesus, having been glorified, ascended to heaven, received the right for us all to live, received the Holy Spirit. And at Pentecost, he came. This tremendous statement of Jesus set everybody guessing. Verse 40 through 44. Is he the prophet? Is he the Christ? Or neither? Verse 40 to 44. Nobody could answer that question. And really, nobody knows Jesus until they trust him. Nobody knows the Lord until they trust him. Some things can only happen from the inside. When you know the Lord, and tr you, when you trust the Lord, you come to know him. And verse 42 makes it perfectly clear. It isn't a matter of the uh, geography or even chronology. Verse 42. Has not the scripture said that the Christ is descended from David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? Notice that the officers appear again in verse 45. The officers then went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why did you not bring him? And the officers answered him, No man ever spoke like this man. The officers come on the, on the scene. But they appear without Jesus in spite of being told to go and arrest him. That's 46. The words of the Lord Jesus had proved so strong for them. No man ever spoke like this man. And at this point, interestingly enough, Nicodemus appears on the scene again. He was what I would call a night school student. Um, if the authorized is correct, it says um, he came by night. Verse 50 to 52. Came to Jesus by night. But he only got abuse for his loyalty. Surely we ought all to listen to one whom we could call the greatest speaker in the world. No man spoke like him. But remember, no man was ever silent like Jesus. <coughs> Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. But like a lamb before a shearer is, is dumb, so opened he not his mouth. Nobody spoke like him with such authority. And nobody was silent like him. That's worth thinking into. But let's get into this eighth chapter, which we called The Light Refused. The Light Refused. Chapter 7, verse 53, really belongs to chapter 8. You notice that once again, verse 53, Jesus found it necessary to be alone. They each went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Over and over again in his ministry, he was doing that. He found it necessary to be alone. It's absolutely ruinous to spend our lives in the company of other people all the time, even though that company is very nice. 
It's absolutely ruinous, I repeat, to spend our lives in the company of other people all the time. No matter how good that company may be. Now let me just say a word to you about this first part of the chapter. The first 11 verses of this chapter are not in many versions. Some put these verses at the end of John's Gospel or at the end of Luke chapter 21. One of the most able uh, of Bible uh, commentators is Westcott and this is um, what he says about it. I'll read it to you. This account of a most characteristic incident in the Lord's life is certainly not a part of John's narrative. The evidence against its genuineness as an original piece of the gospel, both external and internal, is overwhelming. On the other hand, beyond doubt, it is an authentic fragment of an apostolic tradition. The incident seems to belong to a last visit to Jerusalem. It breaks the narrative, introduced perhaps here to illustrate verse 15 of chapter 8 where Jesus says you judge according to the flesh I judge nobody for our purpose in this study of John that's not important but it's um, something we ought to realize and remember but the account of our Lord's dealing with this woman has some wonderful, wonderful things to say to us. And I can't leave it out. This, first of all, take up your pen, second, few seconds. Jesus had no use for people who cover up their sin and point out the sins of others. I repeat that. Jesus has no use for other people who cover up their own sin and point out the sin of other people. These uh, Pharisees hadn't come to the synagogue to worship but they gun to put Jesus in a snare in a trap look at verse 5 verse 5 or verse 4 they said to him teacher this woman has been caught in the act of adultery now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such. What do you say about her? You see the trap they're trying to get him into? Put him in a dilemma. If he recommends mercy, he's opposing the law of Moses. If his judgment is that she should be stoned, then he's in conflict with the civil law of Rome. For the Roman government alone had the right to take life. Inflict, inflict a death penalty. I'll just repeat that so that you may just be clear about the trap they were trying to get Jesus into. If he recommends mercy... He's in opposition to the law of Moses. If you recommend stoning, his judgment will be in conflict with the civil law of Rome, which alone claimed the right of inflicting a death penalty. 
So they try to trap him. They call him teacher. Verse 4. But they certainly hadn't come to be taught. And what does Jesus do in reply? He stoops and writes on the ground. I wish I knew what he'd written. It's the only place in the whole Gospels that we have a record that he wrote anything. Hmm. I wish I knew what he, said, what he wrote. I think, I think, that to people like these Pharisees, he goes on writing until he seems to have written down every sin they've ever committed. And one look from him and they all shrink away. Verse 8. Once more he bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the oldest. That's interesting. I suppose the oldest was the most guilty. They went away one by one, beginning with the oldest. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Have you got the gist of that? The action of our Lord suggests unwillingness to answer their question. And it's only because they were insistent that they got their answer. Verse 7. Please note, won't you? Let me go slow. <clears throat> Freedom from outward guilt does not mean freedom from inward sin. Freedom from outward guilt does not mean freedom from inward sin. They, the Pharisees, caught the force of that. That him was without sin among you be the first to cast a stone. Yes, those Pharisees caught the force of that. And notice this also, that outward guilt doesn't cut somebody off from hope. Outward guilt doesn't cut someone off from hope. She caught the force of that in verses 10 and 11. I'll just repeat that, if I may. Freedom from outward guilt doesn't mean or carry with it freedom from inward sin. Those Pharisees caught that. But outward guilt doesn't cut somebody off from hope. She caught the force of that. Only Jesus, only Jesus can separate I want you to get this down to think it through as so I'll go very slowly and stop me if, if need be only Jesus can separate between the act which he condemns and the sinner whom he forgives I repeat only Jesus can separate between the act which he condemns and the sinner whom he forgives. Jesus does not excuse sin, nor does he condemn the sinner. When they all got out, Jesus looked up and said to a woman, Where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one. Notice the next word, Lord. 
No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and do not sin again. What a moment. Now comes immediately one of Christ's greatest cleanse. Be sure you know what the claims of Jesus were in these opening chapters. Here's one of them in verse 12. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. One of Jesus' great claims. He's made some before this in the Gospel. Got a note of them. In verse 12 to 20, Jesus bears witness. And in verses 21 through 30, he issues a warning. He bears a witness in verses 12 through 20. And in verse 21 through 30, he issues a warning. Now, with your Bibles open, let's look at that a moment, because this is a part we haven't read. Let me read it to you. Verse 13. The Pharisees then said to him, You are bearing witness to yourself. Your testimony is not true. Here is Jesus bearing a witness. His testimony was unsupported. Jesus declared it was supported, supported by his Father. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness to myself, my testimony is true, for I know whence I have come and whither I am going, but you don't know, do not know whence I have come or whither I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is, not, is true, for it is not I alone that judge, but he who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two men is true. I bear witness to myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness to me. They said to him, where is, Therefore, where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Notice that little phrase at the close of verse 20. His hour had not yet come. Look for it through this gospel over and over again. His hour had not yet come. And then in John 17, as Jesus prayed to his father in Gethsemane, Father, the hour is come. God working, as I said this morning, to a timetable. You notice Jesus declaring his witness was supported by his father. Verse 18. And these people could only think of an earthly father. Verse 19. With tremendous authority he claims he was the revelation of his father. What a testimony the Lord Jesus bore. And from that witness, he passes on to give a warning, verses 21 through 30. Just let's read together those, these verses. Verses 21 through 30. Again he said to them, I go away, and you will seek me and die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Then said the Jews, will he kill himself, since he says, where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. And they said to him, Who are you? 
Jesus said to them, Even what I have told you from the beginning, I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world that what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak thus, as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. You will die in your sin. Verse 21 through 24. Underline that threefold repetition. You will die in your sin. Three times over in those verses. Verse 21 through 24. And now we read your notice also. Four times repeated the phrase, the claim, I am. I give you the verses, and maybe you ring the words, but note them if you don't. Verse 23 I am from above. Verse 24. You die in your sins and you believe that I am He. Verse 28. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. And verse 58. Verse 58. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. That's one of the keys to the understanding of John's Gospel. The claim of Jesus. Over and over again, I am he. Already we've one, had one claim like that before, earlier in the Gospel. And that claim was I am the bread of life. I hear it just coming through, right? I am the bread of life. And the other one we've just had is, I am the light of the world. Yes, look for it as we go through. Tremendous claim. And on the line, also in this portion, Christ's reference to his Father. Over and over again, verse 18, I bear witness to myself and the Father, Verse 19, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would have known my father also. 27, they didn't understand that he spoke to them of the father. Verse 28, speak thus as the father taught me. He was full of his father. Slowly get it down. Right. His absolute oneness with his father. Is made clear. By the habit of his life. The habit of his life. Verse 29. He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what is pleasing to him. The habit of his life. I always do what is pleasing to him. And therefore, is known by the quality of his ministry. I repeat that. Christ's reference to his Father, his absolute oneness with his Father, made evident by the habit of his life, and by the quality of his ministry. It wasn't merely a negative sort of obedience. It was ministry that was positively active 
and there's no greater thing in life than to be well pleasing to him but just notice this will you in verse 30 that didn't end the interview between Jesus and these Jews if it had done how different would have been the rest of the story verse 31 and 32 notice this Jesus then said to the Jews who had believed in him if you continue in my word you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth shall make you free Jesus only promises freedom to those who follow him through an imperfect faith I'll just repeat that Jesus only pr promises freedom to those who follow him out of an imperfect faith. There's no real truth, sorry, there's no real freedom outside the truth. And no real freedom apart from Jesus. I repeat it. Sure. Jesus only promises freedom to those who honestly follow him through an imperfect faith. Verses 31 32. There's no real freedom outside the truth, and no real freedom apart from Jesus. see get this Ray hmm. yeah. in an atmosphere of awful hostility many believed on him because of the harmony between what he claimed to be and what he actually was give it to you again ready in an atmosphere of awful hostility many believed on Jesus because of the harmony H-A-R-M-O-N-Y between what he claimed to be and what he actually was there is no escape from the impressiveness of reality no escape from the impressiveness of reality there was harmony between what Jesus claimed to be and what he was no escaping the impressiveness of reality hmm. it's story how the Jews responded to that let me you notice they answered him we are descendants of Abraham and have never been in bondage to anyone how is it that you say you will be made free hold it a moment <laughs> they must have forgotten about Roman occupation forgotten about captivity in Babylon forgotten about being dragged out of Egypt we've never been in bondage to anyone <laughs> hmm. and then Jesus makes a tremendous declaration verse 34 truly truly I say to you everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin the slave does not continue in the house forever the son continues forever so if the son makes you free you will be free indeed I know you are descendants of Abram yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you 
I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. What's Jesus saying? This. Only Jesus can set me free. I'm never really free until I'm not free to be free of God. Oh, you better get that down, get it again. I'm never really free until I'm not free to be free of God. That's Christian living. The Lord snaps one lot of chains and then puts on another. Romans 8, 2. Romans 8, 2. The law of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. Once more. Right. I'll give you a bit more this time. Just a little... <laughs> Sin always enslaves, and so we're slaves bound by greed or indulgence or selfishness or pride or lust and much else. No one can master sin. Only Jesus can set us free. Verse 36. If the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. Tremendous statement. Did he snap your chain? And mine? I'm never really free until I'm not free to be free of God. Got that? <clears throat> I'm never really free till I'm not free to be free of God. He snaps one lot of chains to put on another. Romans 8 2. Sets us free from one law, the law of sin. And masters us by the law of life. Romans 8, 2. To illustrate that, you can ease off. I believe I, oh, I believe I told you in winter school. I don't know what I did. Stop me if I did. But I shall never forget a memorable... Uh, flight I took one day one night from Johannesburg to London uh, overnight flight on British Airways of course if you'll excuse the commercial and um, when I got on the, I don't like flying I'm not really afraid but I'm very prayerful and I'm always thankful to get it what fun is there in air travel honestly uh, pardon me but really I mean, you're shut up in a steel tube and fed and watered like battery hen and eventually you get there. There's no pleasure in it. I used to love the ships, Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary and so on. They were great. But oh, a plane. However, that's all over me now. But this was one of my last trips and it was from Johannesburg. And the plane was packed. And I got in. I was about the last to get on board and found the seat, the only empty one, and next I noticed to me, noticed um, a label saying steward, one of the crew. So I sat down and he came and joined me. I thought it'd be chatty to him. It's unusual for an Englishman. And I said, um, do you like flying these Boeing jets? He said, not very much. I said, why? Oh, he said, sir, they're so often going wrong. Oh. <laughs> uh, Really? <laughs> oh, he said, uh, this one has been taken out of action twice in the last three weeks through engine failure. <laughs> really? <laughs> and I saw the pilot's head at the back of uh, the cockpit, and I said, oh, God bless him tonight. <laughs> and um, we took off with the usual precautions and went to the end of the runway, and there we paused for a moment. And then there was a mighty roar, and off we went. And uh, I know that um, a Boeing jet, 747, fully loaded with passengers and guests, 
takes 46 seconds to get off the ground. Maybe a second or two more or less with wind speed. And so when that plane started, I did something. I have a stopwatch. And when I did what I do in every flight, I start and watch it go round. It went round and the plane went faster. And at 35 seconds, that plane slowed down. The engines seemed to quit pulling. And I held my breath. Presently, in a second or two, they were roaring harder than ever. 46, 48, 50, 52, 56, 60, Lord, how long is this runway? And 62, 62 seconds and whoop! whoop. Just at the moment when the lights marking the end of the runway came underneath. And I said, thank you, Lord, all is well. And we went on. I suppose for about uh, half an hour not a word from the cockpit but I noticed uh, the uh, fasten your safety belt sign was still illuminated and so was the no smoking that sign that was unusual, it didn't concern me actually but I mean there it was, still on and uh, just I noticed my heart beating a little faster and um, presently after about 30 minutes the captain came on the intercom he was terribly English had a terrific Oxford accent and he said um, good evening ladies and gentlemen I am sorry that I had no time to talk with you but I have been very busy I have some sad news for you I've lost an engine <laughs> how do you react when a man would say that to you I react in a stupid way I sort of said in my mind all right old boy don't worry about that I'd gladly jump out and get it for you but of course that <laughs> that would be no use at all what the man was saying unmistakably was I've lost the power of an engine and he said um, my problem is that um, with three engines and a full load of gas and passengers our next stop is Nairobi and I don't think we'll make it so with your permission how unnecessary to say that with your permission we will turn around and go back and you'll be put on another plane and so we turned round and went back and I got on another plane that illustration absolutely fiddles me through and through because that's what the Christian life is all about we get it there's that plane that 747 going along that runway harder and harder and at 35 seconds an engine cuts and three other engines are put on emergency power and go faster than ever but at 46 seconds it's a long way short of the required speed of takeout 150 knots it goes on and on and 162 knots it makes the required speed and the pilot pulls a stick that's very amateur language but it's the equivalent of sticks the nose of that plane up in the air and something grabs it for all that time it has been grabbed by a law which is irrevocable the law of gravity now it's reached the required speed takes, puts his nose up in the air and another arm grabs it and lifts it and puts it under the control of the law of aerodynamics and that's adequate to lift it up above the law of gravity and to set it on course the sheer thrust of three Boeing jet engines enable it to, to get up to its height and keep it <laughs> and uh, there was a time in my life and in yours when we condemned by the law of death held down but we may I just say we lifted our hearts to the Lord and in answer to that he grabbed us and put us under the dominion of a new law which overcomes the law of sin and death and sets us free free in obedience to the Lord Jesus have you got it? if you have really got it that should make you stand up and shout hallelujah I'm free free in Christ but bondage in Christ bound by another law altogether a law from heaven which gives me perfect liberty to do the will of God Amen Amen Good night The Lord bless you Just a prayer together Lord how can we ever praise you Thank you enough for what you've done to set us free 
Teach each one of us to claim that freedom right now. To claim freedom from the pollution and the power and the penalty of the sin. That we may know the truth and the truth shall set us free. And if the Son shall set us free, we shall be free indeed. I will praise you for our risen, triumphant Lord and for the victory which he gives us in himself. Now bless us through this week and make our weekend and make our lives mighty blessing to others. Wherever we are, may Jesus be reflected through each one of us. Lord, answer prayer. For your name's sake. Amen.